I am delighted to welcome this morning to our AAFLFC podcast, Representative Ryan Sexo. Um, and Ryan, I, if I may, um, Ryan is a third term member of the Maine House of Representatives. He operates a retail store in Ogonquit, Maine. Secto was born and raised in Biddeford and attended Biddeford High School. He completed a four-year degree at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., where he studied political science and theology and religious studies. He previously chaired the LCREB committee in the 128th legislature and now serves as the assistant House Majority Leader. His areas of focus include being a strong voice for seniors, standing up for public education, and making Maine a more attractive uh, place for young people to work with and raise a family. Now, Ryan, you've accomplished so much, and if you forgive me, you're so very young. Um, please tell us a little about what led you to become involved in public life. I noticed that your Twitter profile reads Proud Franco American. Yeah, I, I uh, grew up here in Biddeford, my hometown. Um, I went to school, as you mentioned, uh, Kathy, in, in DC, um, where I had the opportunity, obviously, to be at the heart of government here in the United States and uh, to have so much uh, access to uh, public life and also um, advocacy. Um, I decided to come home uh, after I graduated and I ran for office immediately. So I was elected at 22 years old, um, really because wow. I. I <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, in, in fact, the district was previously represented by uh, Representative Paulette Bodwin, uh, another Franco, who um, was in her 80s. So overnight, you know, uh, I won the election and the, and the district went from, a tw uh, from an 80 year old to a 20 year old. Uh, so that's pretty, a pretty drastic change. Um, but, you know, the, the motivation for me was looking at my community and seeing um, how many people my age didn't see a future in Maine. They, they either chose to go uh, to college elsewhere and had no intention of coming back, or they did go to college here and they were, you know, excited and looking for an opportunity outside of the state. Um, Maine is one of the oldest states in the country. And so I felt like there wasn't enough young voices, there weren't enough young voices in Augusta, um, uh, you know, having, having conversations about why it is young people were choosing not to stay here and how we could get them to uh, you know, choose Maine as the place that they were going to work, live and raise a family. You know, um, Ryan, I'm very interested also in hearing your thoughts about the French language and Francophone culture mm -hmm. in Maine and about the future of French. Yeah, I, you know, I think what's really exciting I, I, at this moment, I, I f it feels like, uh, in the last couple of years, there's been greater organization around uh, getting young people, but all people um, who have connections to Franco-American culture uh, connected. Um, there's, been a, there's been several organizations that have started to spring up here in Maine um, that are that before the pandemic, uh, <laughs> we're, we're hosting events around the state. There were a few that I, I think actually perhaps the last like real event I went to with, you know, people and an open bar and food <laughs> was, uh, was, a, was, the, was one of the events hosted by this organization that um, has been promoting French culture in, in Maine. Um, and and uh, there's a professor at, at Bates College who was featured at that event and uh, she is uh, Franco as well. So, you know, just really, uh, really getting, a, I think, a stronger sense that, you know, we have an obligation to find ways in which to, uh, uh, to protect, but also share this culture that I think is so um, ingrained in Maine's in Maine's identity, and, and so I'm I'm excited. I think there's a there's I think there was a little bit of a lull for a while, but I think there's really become this sense that uh, of urgency in terms of um, you know being together and learning about our culture together, but also protecting it and sharing it with with others. Um, I think especially folks in my generation who, um, uh, you know, I think of my meme and Pepe who moved uh, to Maine in 1964 from Quebec and um, they, uh, they have, uh, I think, a bit of a struggle or, you know, had a bit of a struggle with, with that identity, the Franco identity, because um, there was such an urgency 
to assimilate and to uh, try to fit in. And for me, you know, uh, I don't have some of the shame, I guess, that, that might resonate for uh, folks like my meme who, um, you know, was concerned that, you know, speaking French would hold her back from employment opportunities or uh, being Catholic would, would somehow stigmatize her. You know, those, those cultural identities that I think my, my grandparents were concerned about, uh, I obviously don't have those same concerns, but instead, I feel an immense amount of pride about who I am. And, and I think that's sort of the, the turning point that I think we're starting to see amongst my generation of Franco. Now that is really um, great to hear. Um, I myself, I was fortunate enough to have been able to go to school in Quebec, lived in Quebec um, for several years. And, um, you know, I'm delighted to, to, to hear what you're saying about, um, it sounds like it's a, a, a resurgence of mm -hmm. interest in mm -hmm. uh, both French language and Franco-American culture in Maine and in your area. I know Biddeford is certainly a historically uh, Franco-American community. Um, um, what do you think, Brian, about the future of French language and Francophone culture generally, you know, in the U.S., in the Northeast, certainly, in New England, and maybe even beyond? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like there is, um, you know, I, I think that there's this, there's this great opportunity um, for the United States as a whole to um, find ways to embrace uh, Franco identity and Franco culture. I think the French language is an interesting one. Uh, I think that's probably where we have a lot of work left, I think on our, you know, in the future for us to, to, to tackle. I, I always tell the story about how um, uh, in sixth grade is when the, in Maine, when you get the opportunity to, to choose your foreign language. So I had a choice, French or Spanish. I of course chose French because my dad sp sp speaks it at home and uh, my meme and Pepe spoke it as well. Uh, I, however, uh, admittedly, uh, did not learn very much and um, I understand quite a bit, but not, not enough to speak fluently. Um, and so I chose French, but I quickly realized that it was, that I was, that it was not going to be very much help to have my father speaking French at home because he of course is speaking Quebecois and has, I'm sure adopted a great deal of slang over, uh, over the years from, from being in the United States. And so, uh, when I brought my homework to the teacher, you know, I was getting a lot of, a lot of, there was a lot more red on the page than I would, would have anticipated. Um, of course, you know, we're, we were learning Parisian French and there are some, there are certainly some, some ways in which it differs. And so I ended up switching to Spanish. And so I learned, I learned Spanish through middle school and high school and college. Um, so, the, you know, I think, I think one thing that I, that I find interesting in Maine, especially um, in the New England states where uh, there's obviously a, a connection to Quebecois, uh, but not necessarily that deep, you know, not necessarily this, the same kind of connection you would have to Parisian French. So, um, you know, I, I do wonder what the future holds for, um, for the French language as um, Spanish obviously has become, uh, you know, a, a language that most people in the United States are seeing as almost necessary as more as there's more and more uh, Spanish speakers across the country. But, you know, I think, I think, I think there's a, I think there's a, a lot for, you know, as a community for all of us to discuss, how can we make sure that the French language um, is promoted and that young people especially um, are interested. And I, and I think part of the problem as well, you know, uh, in terms of how we set up a, our schools, and I, I think this is the case for uh, most uh, schools across the country is uh, foreign language, whether it's Spanish or French or, or otherwise, it's introduced, I think, a bit too late. Um, Absolutely. And, and that's, that's part of the challenge as well. You know, I, I know education is an area that's of special interest to you. And um, from what I'm understanding from what you're saying is really, you would probably like to see foreign languages generally taught beginning at an earlier age. Definitely. You know, and, and what you're saying is absolutely in alignment with all of the um, best research that's been done. While we can learn a language at any age, we learn it differently as we get older, but also uh, starting at an early age gives you the most years of schooling that you can build on 
So for example, if you don't start a foreign language until you're later in school, you have fewer years to build on that, that continued study. Exactly. Um, it, will, it also sounds like um, uh, you're thinking about uh, ways of awakening interest in French language and Francophone culture. And uh, from your perspective, you know, as a, a public figure, um, and also as a, a, a young person, you know, and young people and children are, of course, our future. Uh, what, what would you think would be ways that would resonate with young people like yourself and even younger folks? That's a really, that's a really good question. I, I, think, I, think, I think for me, at least, the, one of the biggest motivators is just, first of all, learning about my own family. And um, I think for, for young people who have connections to uh, Franco culture, uh, I think the more they learn about who they are and where they've come from, I think the greater the spark is for uh, pursuing an interest in the, in, the, in the language itself. You know, if I, if I had this appreciation that I have now for uh, my Franco-American identity, that I, at a younger age, I probably, first of all, would have stuck with French, but I also probably would have, probably would have been uh, more persistent with my father in terms of making sure that when I was around him, that he was only speaking French so that I had more, um, you know, a greater, a greater motivation to, to learn the language. Um, you know, I, now, now when I'm around it, it's mostly with my dad and my meme and uh, I, uh, I, I understand when they're talking about food, <laughs> but not necessarily much, much else, you know, and I understand when Meme is mad at me, those two things I am, I am very certain food and, and when she, when she is uh, dissatisfied with, with something I've done, but otherwise, you know, it's a little bit more of a challenge. So I think, I think first of all, sparking the interest, uh, making sure that young people know who they are and where they've come from, you know, and then I think second, second to that is, um, uh, showing people the possibilities that exist by learning a, a, a second language. And I think uh, that's often lost, especially for young people, because, you know, you see your world as, you know, so, so limited when you're, when you're at that age, everything is, you know, it's, it's, it's why, you know, drama in high school is, is so pr profound. It seems like every, every little thing that happens is the end of the world because you don't really get a sense of, you know, how big the world is and how, and how immense the possibilities are. Uh, one thing that I think is good that's happening here in New England is the Quebec consulate has made a, a more intentional effort with it, with bringing uh, French French programs to schools. I believe they've in initiated two programs uh, in uh, two Massachusetts school districts, uh, which I think will be huge. And Maine does have a, a French a French language school as well uh, in Freeport. And uh, you know, I think again. Uh, obviously, one of the barriers to that program is, is cost. And so um, also making sure that uh, young people that are interested in pursuing uh, the French language have the ability to do so regardless of their socioeconomic status. You know, that's a very important point. Um, research, there are two major research studies that have been done that have demonstrated that bilingualism especially benefits lower income children. Uh, so absolutely, it's uh, what you're saying is once again in alignment with all the very best of current research. Uh, so Ryan, if you had advice for um, young people uh, and young people with young families, um, what would your advice be to them about maybe starting to bring back Francophone culture and possibly French language into the household? Yeah, my, my, my advice would be to to pursue it. I think there's so I think there's so many great opportunities um, here in the state of Maine and elsewhere in terms of getting that connectedness. Uh, first of all, you know, make, make encourage your your students to or your young people and your and your families to take up a foreign language and particularly French. Um, you know, when the border opens again, get, you know, bring bring hopefully you know, soon. <laughs> make that yes, yes, hopefully soon. Make make that family vacation not to Cancun, but rather to, uh, you know, to Quebec City, where there's that opportunity to get like a, a real taste of, or Montreal, where you can get that taste of, um, of the culture. And I think I think that generate I think that inspires within young people the sense of importance of learning of another language when you're in a place. Um, a, a full immersion where you quickly learn that, you know, English 
uh, is not your best tool of communication, but rather, you know, having the, the ability to possess a, a, another, a, the command of another language. Um, I, I visited France uh, two years ago, two winters ago, and uh, I, sh I mean, I certainly would have, would have loved to have been able to hold, hold conversations a lot better than I did. Fortunately, I had a, my, my, my good friend who's a, a now former uh, French teacher here in Biddeford. Uh, she's now a the head women's rugby coach at the University of New England, uh, but she taught French. So I, I relied on her extensively for for communicative communicative uh, purposes. But um, you know, you know, that's the you know the things I think we can do in terms of driving folks to uh, embrace and, and understand the culture, and also look at uh, take a look at events that are happening. I think people would be surprised by um, how many organizations and, and events are occurring within their own communities that are centered around Franco-American culture? You know, I think those are great points. Um, even now during the pandemic, which will end at some point, there are a lot of events taking place um, online via Zoom and other video conferencing uh, tools. And many of them are free of charge and they open to everybody. And also, I think mentioning your trip to Paris, you know, I think that first step of reconnecting with our own culture and the proximity of Quebec, I often tell my own students, it's really just up the road. Really and, um, you know, you could, after class, you could get in your car and be having breakfast in Montreal, uh, <laughs> no problem. And, um, you know, they don't, they don't always think of that. Um, but also, I think mentioning your trip to Paris, that honestly, through making that step and reconnecting with your own personal identity, you're also the becoming part of this worldwide community of um, French speakers of Francophone culture, and your possibilities really are, are limitless. Definitely, definitely. And I, and I think I think the other thing to think about is the fact that there are many uh, folks who um, have deep connections that are willing to share what, why, why it is that they are inspired by the connection to their to their Franco culture? I think of, uh, for example, here in Biddeford, um, the mills were obviously a large attraction for uh, Franco families, you know, families from Quebec to move to Biddeford. Um, the mills have obviously since since closed in terms of the operation of being a, a textile mill, but they are now, you know, uh, they're now home to hundreds of businesses, manufacturing light manufacturing artists, uh, artists, um, and, and, and bake, bakeries and all sorts of different things. Uh, in addition, there are also thousands of apartments now in the mills, but what's really important is the mill, the person who built, uh, purchased our mill, our mill complex in our downtown, um, he carved out spaces to maintain the original format of the mill so that we could create a mills museum. The mills museum tours, uh, which were being led before the pandemic, uh, are, are led by former mill workers who many of them are Franco. Uh, and so the story of the mills um, are not, it's not just a, a story of industrial, the industrialization of our nation or, you know, manufacturing or, you know, industry. Um, it's a story about, about Franco American culture as well. And many of the stories that they share and the many of the stories that have been integrated into uh, the, the, the exhibits in, in the mills in the mills museum relate back to uh, franco-american culture and so there's opportunities for us to find inspiration or learn about who we are um, in maybe places we don't necessarily expect to find them i, I think the, it's the same case in lowell uh, at the, uh, the in lowell massachusetts there's the franco story there as well um, even though it's a you know a mill a story about the mills it's it's more than that Ryan, thank you so much. That really, your words are so inspirational. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. I truly appreciate it. Uh, please accept my mayor of my best wishes to you uh, now and, and moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And anytime you're in Biddeford, please let me know. We'll, uh, we'll make sure you get a tour of the mills here. So I'll hold you to it. Thank you so much, Ryan. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy.